And I'm excited about tonight because we're going to talk about calling. Um, does anybody have any experience with the calling of God? Like, this is a powerful, powerful idea that this God who is eternal, and in some cases, people might consider him to be just historic. He's actually very personal. And he doesn't just use preachers. Again, I shouldn't be up here. I'm, as of, you know, I'm 42, but for 90% of my life, I was terrified to talk in front of people. So somehow God got a hold of this introvert and made him an extrovert uh, in certain circumstances. <laughs> if I was in a social setting, I'm going to be totally off into the corner. I'm not like working the room or whatever. But in situations like this, see, I responded to a calling. What I mean by that is that God came to me and he said, you're going to preach my word. And when I say that, like, anybody know what bone conducting technology is? They used to have this thing and uh, I don't know if they still sell them or not, but the idea that basically you can have these earbuds that, or, or even these glasses that the song or the sound, you can't hear it, but it's vibrating through the actual apparatus itself. So it conducts into your bones and you hear the sound. So I had this encounter with God uh, in college where I was asleep three o'clock in the morning and then boom, got hit with what I thought was a bolt of lightning and I felt and heard the words, you will preach my word. So in case you're wondering if I'm a weirdo, yes, check, I am. I've had some weird experiences, but they're good experiences. I've had some weird bad experiences too. Anybody have any experiences with the demonic? Anybody? Or does that make sense? Like, yeah, I mean that, yeah. Again, this is where, you know, we can, we can do real talk here. Again, some of this, again, I, I do have a Bible. I, I don't have a technical Bible degree, but I do have a degree that um, was 99% biblical studies. I, I wanted to be a pro baseball player, so I didn't really care about education. Um, but I took all the Bible classes and everything. And one of the main uh, classes I took was called practical theology. So basically, you got a bunch of theology, you know, so we can sit here and learn creeds and doctrines or whatever. But at the end of the day, theology doesn't really matter unless it's practical. If that makes sense? The theology that we have, like, I'm not sure. Uh, are you guys in your 20s, 30s? Where, where are you guys at? Okay, what about you? Yeah, so we don't want to get into our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and just like, I don't want to be like that guy in the church and we all know what we're talking about or that, that lady in the church like, uh, you know, they had this old skit on SNL called The Church Lady. It's like, we don't want to be like that. And what, what do I mean? I'm talking about somebody who is like a professional Christian, knows all the things. They're not, they're not even Christians. They're like, it's like, it's not Christianity, it's churchianity. In other words, they know church and they know the Bible, but there, there's no practical application. In other words, I don't, I don't see Jesus in this person, you know? So the older I get, I better be more Jesus, right? I don't need to be more Christian. I need to be more like Jesus. I don't need to be more, wow, he's a really good church goer. He, I need to be like Jesus. And hopefully that's what's happening to me. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight is the practical theology of the calling of God and the fact that God is a God that does call. Now that implies that there's the option to answer the option to pick up, God can bring something. You know, they say like, I'm picking up what you're putting down. You know, this guy the other day, he's like, yeah, I'm stepping, he's like, I'm stepping in what you're dropping. You know, it's like, that's kind of a crude version of it. But my point is that there's this idea that God has a message and he has like a mission and he's trying to work with some people. Some people think God just does it all himself. That's just not true. God has to use people. He uses people. He comes to people to get stuff done. Otherwise, he just would have done it all himself, you know? Um, so how does he do that? He, he comes to people and he's like, hey, you know, sometimes he knocks on the door and there's that, you know, of course, we don't have uh, what, the call waiting anymore, right? You know, where it's like the, you kind of hear the ding, 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 ding. That's an old thing. The point is, is that we can, we can ghost the call of God. I mean, you guys ever just be honest. How many of you have ever like ghosted somebody or, you know, you, you uh, blocked them or whatever. I'm not interested in whoever's trying to talk to me. 
And so we do that with God. So let's get into Romans 8, and we're going we're gonna to highlight verse 28, but we're going to start in verse 1, so we're going to read a lot of Bible tonight. Verse 1, and I'm in the message, which is a paraphrase. Uh, with the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. So my, my quick sermon to you is that uh, no matter the problem, the answer is Jesus. Whatever the dilemma is, the answer is Jesus. I don't, I'm not trying to be too cliche about it, but to be honest, the answer is Jesus. Your relational problems, your money problems, your career problems, your sin problems, every problem in your life, the answer is Jesus. So no matter what you try to do, ultimately you're going to find yourself right back to him. So why, why waste time? Let's just start right at the source. Amen? Does that make sense? He's the solution to the fateful dilemma. Those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Can you guys testify that sin is a brutal tyrant? Sin rules. Sin dominates. Jesus' name means freedom from sin, salvation from sin. So what, did, what am I saved from? Well, we can talk about hell. We can talk about all that. But the most immediate reason for Jesus is that he saves us and frees us from sin. You don't have to. That, now, this is not a matter that we don't sin ever, but it's the idea that you don't have to have sin have you. I always say, I have sin, but sin doesn't have me. So when sin comes to your consciousness through the blood of Jesus, you can repent and then he will give you freedom from that sin. So we don't have to have addictions. We don't have to have bondages. The blood of Jesus is enough to break even generational sins, sins that our mom and dads had that we inherit because there are generational curses that happen. Jesus' blood can break that, okay? Alcoholism, drug, whatever. This is the hope that we have, that, that we don't just have to be forgiven of sin, which is wonderful. I grew up Baptist. The forgiveness of sin was the sermon. You're forgiven. You're not going to go to hell. Amen. But I was bound by sin every day of my life. And I was like, oh, one sweet morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. But later I discovered that Jesus' blood not only gave me freedom or forgiveness of sin, he also gave me freedom from sin. And I discovered that if I was in a sin, I could bring him my sin and he would give me the power, not my power, it was his power in me to walk free of that sin. And I didn't have that anymore. So I don't walk around lugging my stuff along with me. Oh, I did this, I did that. No, I took it. I gave it to the blood of Jesus. I put it at the cross and he wipes it as far as the east is from the west. Isn't that amazing that he does that? He will take your sin whatever you were, and he will remove that. And then you get this whole new crop of, of stuff that you didn't even know was there. And you get to let him deal with that too. Isn't that amazing? Like the, the stuff of your, of your teens, he can wipe that away. And then you get all this new stuff in your 20s. He'll wipe that away. Then your 30s come, he'll wipe that away. And you get the powerful destiny of I'm going to become more and more like Jesus the rest of my life. Isn't that amazing? That's your future, by the way. In Christ, your calling is to become more like him. Like, you know, stuff happens that never happened before. And then you get tested in a thing you've never been tested in before. And then you find out that you struggle in an area you never struggled in before. And you, all of a sudden you find out, oh, well, I got to come back to Jesus because I'm facing something that I've never faced before. But he faced everything. He faced every sin. He faced every temptation. He passed every test. So I go to him and I say, hey, you know that thing that you took on? I'm in the middle of that and I'd like to receive your grace to overcome that now. And he says, do you believe it? And I said, yes, I do. And he says, then it's done. This is all about faith. Isn't that amazing? Verse 3. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. So, 
We don't have a big group here tonight, but I'm preaching to you guys like there's 3,000 people in here. Does that make sense? I'm coming to you guys with this level of intensity and intention because he cares about every one of you so much. There's not, it's not remote. It's not arbitrary. The things I'm saying to you tonight are exactly what God has designed for you to hear right now. It's like a key unlocking that place in your heart that you need Him to get access to. Isn't that amazing? He knows what's locked up. And we had a, a man Tuesday night at this men's ministry, and he was, just, he was just sobbing the whole time I was speaking. And he said, and I said, do not, my, my sermon was about the Holy Spirit. And I said, don't resist the Holy Spirit. This is Acts 7. He says, I can't let go of control. And, he, and so he wanted prayer, and I said, just open up your hands. And the more he did it, the less he could stand up, and he just started to just tremble under the power of God. And he was free. Isn't that amazing? Because he let go of control. Anybody have any, any control freaks in the house, right? Let go. Trust. Remember what I said. We're going to end back up at Jesus. He is the end and the beginning, right? That's Alpha and Omega. He's where you start. He's where you finish. In His Son, Jesus, He personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. So, it is out of order. It is a disordered, chaotic mess. That's okay. It's okay that it's chaos. Bring it. Accept it. Confess it. Release it. Surrender it. And guess what? Receive the freedom. Let it go, but don't read the fine print. Does that make sense? Don't wait to sign on the dotted line before you go through the fine print. The Lord is saying, bring it to me. Don't say, well, Lord, I need to know what you're going to do with it. No, no, no. Bring it. And then rather than kind of, you know, play like spiritual ninja where you're, well, I'm not sure if I want the things you have for me, Jesus. No, no, no. Let him have, let him have you. The, see, I preach this a lot. I say Jesus was not merely our substitute. He was also our example. He's not just the substitute who did it for us. He's also the model. And so when Jesus does this, this is what he wants for us to do as well. What's the key to life? The key to life is vulnerability. The key to life is openness. Now we want to, you know, again, we want to be spiritual ninjas. We want to guard. We want to we protect. We want to defend. We've been hurt. We get that. But when we do that, then we, we steal God's opportunity to be our defender to be our advocate, to be the one who speaks on for us. And this is the problem with the day of judgment is I don't want to stand before God and say, no, 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 Jesus, you sit down. I, I have a record that I can stand next to. I don't have a record I can stand next to. My record's jacked up. But his is wonderful. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could have never done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. See, that's the power of the, the Bible. And I try to teach this to the young guys, is that the, the commandments are explicitly designed to teach us that we can't do it. Go ahead. Be forgiving. Be uh, Hate less, be covetous less, be murderlessness, be lustless. You can't do it. You're going to screw it up, right? You're going to fail. And that was the whole point of like, you think you got it? So in all of us is sin and sin is sleeping. And when a commandment or a law is presented to us, that sin says, who are you talking to? What, what? No, no, no. Uh, you can't tell me what to do. And then we have a choice what to do with that sin that's just cropped up. You know, if I said, hey, it's all good, nobody cares, it's all, there's no law, you'd be like, yeah, it's fine, everything's well. But if I tell you, don't 
Don't covet your neighbor's wife. What? What do you mean? You don't tell me. To, don't, don't hate your neighbor. Don't gossip. Don't, you know, don't lie. Something in you just, you know, gets mad. When you feel that, then you get an opportunity to say, hey, you know, this person said this thing to me. Well, you can engage in the fight or you can say, hey, Jesus, there's another one. I can't, I can't deal with this. This is here. We're not trying to deflect it. We're not trying to deny it. We're not trying to explain it away. We're saying the law that I tried to obey, I can't do it. So, you know, let's just admit we can't obey the law. We can't. You, you might be the most disciplined person. You might be, you know, Jocko Willink or this guy, David Goggins, these, most, these, these Navy SEAL. You might be the most disciplined guy in the world, but you can't obey the law of God by your discipline. There's only one person who ever obeyed the law of God completely. And this is where we say to him, hey, I need what you did in the earth to come into this. And I believe that you want that. And now what the law code asked for but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. So I'm, I'm here to say to you, hey, let's take a vacation. Your efforts that are so tiring, that are wearing you out, like the Spirit of God is ready to get to work in you. Will you stop your efforts and just let Him take over? Will you let him take over in these areas of your life that you're not seeing God work in? God, would you please get to work in these areas? You'd be shocked at what he'll do. You know what's amazing is about four weeks ago, we started praying. We pray every, every Thursday at 539 for the next generation. So we pray for the kids all the way up to the young adults in college. And I thought it was cool that four weeks ago we started praying and then this, these revivals broke out all over the country in these college campuses, like the last two weeks. And I'm not saying we caused it, but I am saying that we've been contending and praying for something like that to happen in this country, and it did. So guess who did that? I didn't do that. That was the Spirit of God doing that. And the Spirit of God is going to do it in you if you'll stop working yourself, if you'll enter into the rest. What does that mean? Jesus comes to you and he tells you, hey, I already did it all. I did it all. I did everything. Do you believe me? Okay. Come on up here into the finished work. See, it's like he ran the race. He's already sat down. He finished the race and he says, you don't have to run. Come over here, sit down next to me and you get the results I got. First place. But you got to stop running. Of course, you know, it's hard to do that whenever you want the credit of doing the running. But we run out of time. We run out of energy. We get worn out. We get deceived thinking that we're supposed to do it, but we can't. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is the dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Is that preached today in 2023? Focusing on self is the opposite of focusing on God. You know, I'll be honest, I don't do social media. I just can't. Because I'm on it for five minutes and then I'm just like, what is happening to my brain? I just, I don't have, and I understand some people use it and they, they have people they connect with, but just... I want to be God conscious, not self conscious. I grew up self conscious. I grew up with this like staring awareness of me, and I'm like, oh, what do they think about me? And am I enough? And it's like when I finally had a revelation of the presence of God, I never wanted to focus on me again. I was like, I can tell God's here, God's with me. I'm not enough, but God is. And that made me confident, which by the way means with faith, not faith in me. Faith in God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he's doing. And God isn't pleased at being ignored. Does anybody like to be ignored? I mean, you come into a room, nobody talks to you. Maybe they look up at you and then they ignore you, you know. I mean, people do that to God all the time. They ignore him. I preached at the high school about the broken heart of God. I talked about Hosea. I said... People are unfaithful. It's like, 
We have an opportunity to turn our attention to Him now. Will we do that? Will we turn our attention to Him with what He's doing? Hey God, how are you feeling today? What are your needs? What's bothering you? Do you need a friend today? Imagine, imagine what type of a presence you would feel if you came to Him with that type of a heart. Hey Lord, I'm here for you. I mean, he already did all of the work, and now we get a chance to respond to that. But if God, verse 9, if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. And, that, and that's kind of important, too. I can tell, you know, when I'm talking to people and, I'm talking weird spirit stuff, and they're just kind of like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. I didn't know about that either. The spirit doesn't make too much sense here. But man, it makes sense here. You know, the Hebrew word for heart's actually navel, too. So, like, this is your heart. Not here. Right there. Right where you, right in your, you know, right in your knower. You know, I had this, this guy at the men's ministry come up, and I hadn't ever seen him before. But we talked for three seconds, and I said, I've known you my whole life. He says, I have known you my whole life, too. We just, there was just a connection. What is that? That's God in him. I'm not trying to get into some weird namaste thing or whatever, but that's the Spirit of God in him connecting with the Spirit of God in me. Isn't that amazing? That's real church, by the way. Not, hey, let's go play ping pong. It's Spirit of God in you connecting with the Spirit of God in someone else, and boom. That creates a power powerhouse. But for you who welcome Him, in whom He dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. So again, I, my friend Armando says, it's not that you're sinless, it's that you sin less. You sin less. You're not sinless, but you sin less. I say, I have sin, but sin doesn't have me. So we do have limitations of sin, absolutely, but in Christ, there's freedom. Amen? There's freedom in Christ. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, He'll do the same thing in you that He did in Jesus. I'm going to read that again because that's, that's just laying it down right there. If the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, He will do the same thing in you that He did in Jesus. I mean, that'll wake you up right there. What God did in Jesus, He'll do in you. Bringing you alive to himself, life anew, fully alive. I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. I have everything I need in him. Satisfied, wholly satisfied, completely satisfied, completely alive. This is what I was made for. This is, and all of a sudden, boom, I become a manifestation of God's glory. And like I told the middle schoolers on Sunday, some, some people, I'm the only Bible they'll ever read, right? You're the only Bible they'll ever read. You're a reflection of the glory of God Himself. You're not God, but you're a reflection of His glory. When God lives and breathes in you, and He does as surely as He did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. Stop dragging it around. It's gone. It's not who you are anymore. It's over. It's that simple. It really is. Walk away from it. It has no power over you. I always said, so sin is the slave master. Jesus breaks the power of sin as a slave master. You're free to walk away. Do you have the freedom to go back into it because you like it more? Of course you do. But you're free from it. You, you know, again, maybe you like it a lot and you go back into it and then that's a whole other sermon. But the point is, you're not there because you have to be. You don't have to drag it around. I preached to the 
high school again, I talked about worshiping the wound. Some of us, we have a wound. We don't want to be healed. We like the wound. We like the excuse. We like the ability to say, well, I've got an alibi. I don't have to step into that because I've got this thing. Jesus comes to a man at the pool of Bethesda and he asks him a very important question. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be forgiven? Do you want to be free? Or do you like the ability to say, well, that's just where I'm at. That's just my family. Oh, you know us, whatever your last name is, that's just what we do. No, no, no. I can be free of that because I'm grafted into a new, a new branch. That's not who I am anymore. God's so big on this, he will literally change your name. Change Peter's name, change Abraham's name, change Sarah's name, change Benjamin's name, change his names. Isn't that amazing? With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give a decent burial and get on with your new life. If you guys... If you guys believe in Christ, He's your Lord and Savior. If you haven't been water baptized, I highly encourage you to do it because it's an amazing sacrament where you demonstrate I am no longer alive and I'm a brand new person. God's Spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. Verse 15 in Romans 8. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? That's crazy, isn't it? That's a cool, I've never read that part. Like, that childlike anticipation of what has God got in store for me now? See, when I have these sins and I know they're there and I think they're going to be with me for the rest of my life, then I go ahead and budget them into my expectations. I, I know where I'm going to trip up. I know where I'm going to fall, so I don't want to go there. Can't you hear the devil in that? No, no, no. That's who you are. You'll, you'll never get past this point. You'll never go that past this point in your education. You'll never go this, past this point in your relationships. You'll never go past this point financially because it's never been done. It's just who you are. And Jesus is saying by his spirit, no, that can be broken. That doesn't have to be where it is. By his spirit, he says, say goodbye to the old. And then like a child, what, what do you want to do with me, God? What can he do? Again, what could God do with a man or woman totally surrendered to his will? Has the world seen a man or a woman who has said to God, other than Jesus, Lord, completely I'm willing to do whatever you want. Maybe that person's here today. This resurrection life you receive from God is not uh, timid. I said that. God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is and we know who we are, Father and children. And that this is important. I talk about this a lot. Some people that have bad relations with their dads, they like Jesus, but they don't like the idea of God the Father. I don't want to talk about the Father. I hate dads. I hate fathers. I, I just like Jesus. The problem with that is that Jesus is designed to be, he says explicitly, I am the doorway and the gateway to the Father. So God wants you, through Christ, to have complete restoration to the Father God. Don't just stop at Jesus. That's not the final point. Jesus will lead you to the Father. And when you have a restoration to your Father, you know who you are. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. Do you have tonight an amazingly positive expectation of the future? Do you have a leaning forward, positive expectation of immense hope about what's to come? Or are you more like, I'm not sure, I think it's all bad. I mean, I, I'm around some people and they're like, oh, did you hear what this... Do you hear what these people are doing in, in the government? Do you hear what that's happening in the country? Do you hear what's going on over there? It's like all the bad stuff that's going to happen. Oh, do you know what's going to Man, that, that'll shorten your life. 
We can't do anything about that stuff, but we can do something about it. I believe God is good, God's got good plans, and I'm going to have hope. Isn't that powerful? I'm going to have hope. And in the midst, did you know that a lot of this book and all this powerful positivity that you read was written in the midst of Christians getting just violently persecuted and martyred and all of that? And in the midst of that, man, do we have hope. How many of you know if you get through something really hard, it gives you confidence for the next day? I mean, if you just live a powder puff life, man, you face any form, it's like, oh my God, it's 84 degrees outside, I'm going to melt. Give me a break. I mowed yards on 105 growing up. So I got a little bit of confidence in what I can do. But man, whatever you're going through, whatever lion's den, whatever fiery furnace you're going through, imagine if God is with you in it, you get through it, you step out of that, you ready for the next day? Come on. God, what can God do with someone who has a positive expectation of what's to come? Leaning forward. Somebody say amen if you believe you got an inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with Him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with Him. Man, we're going to go through the hard times. How many of you are glad? I mean, you're getting tempered and tested and tried and turned into the man or woman, not the child, but the man or the woman that God has designed you to be. You go through it, and then he says, now it's time for you to experience my goodness, my glory, my inheritance, my resurrection power. Why? Because you didn't faint in the day of trial. You got through it. Hey, if you're going through a hard time right now, here's the word of the Lord to you. Just keep standing. Just get through it. Get through today. Because when this thing is over, you're going to be able to hold that thing up like a, like a battle trophy. Say, I got through it. I got through it. That's one more for you. Through the power of God, the Bible says in Philippians 4.13, in the context of being abased, being abased as in I was, I was at the bottom and then I found out there was a basement. I was at my lowest, and then I found out there was a basement. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was at the worst, and then I found out there was worse. You've been abased, but you also abound in the midst of both of that. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. I can go through that. You get bad news. I can go through that through Christ. But you know what? I can also be promoted through Christ. I can also prosper through Christ. I can also have an inheritance for my children's children through Christ. Amen? And the curse of poverty can be broken. Not because I'm greedy, but because in some cases, it's a legitimate curse of poverty. And God says, I want to break that off of you and your family. Because I want you to be a blessing so that you can establish my covenant in the earth. That's the purpose of prosperity, is to establish the covenant of God in the earth. It's not so you're supposed to have some fancy pants designer or whatever, it's so that you can spread his word and manifest his glory. And so that you don't have any area of your life where you're like, well, yeah, that's just an area where it just is what it is. No. But there's some people, they may come from extravagant wealth and the Lord says, I want you to give it all away. Oh, I can't do that, Lord. No, no, no. Again, God says, you can have wealth, but don't let wealth have you. And if wealth has you, you better give that stuff up. He said to that rich young ruler, man, no, no, no. That wealth has you. You got to let that go. because That's going to consume you till the day you die. But there are other people, they're like, oh, I can't have provision. I can't have resources. I, it's just not part of me. And they just, they sabotage everything in their life. And God says, I want to break that. I want to break that off your life. There are people who've never, their their bloodline has never even owned a home. And God says, I want to give you a home. I want to give you a house. I want you to turn that into a blessing and and an abode for my glory. But other people, he'll tell them, I want you to give that house away. Why? Because that house has you. Give that car away. Why? Because the car has you. But other people, he'll be like, hey, I'm going to give you a car. Why? Because I want to bless you. Why? Because you've been believing. Why? Because you know you can't get it without me. You know, people get 
He would get upset when you talk about money in church. Again, this is about, it's not about having money. It's about money having you. It's about this thing called mammon, which is a God. It's about where money, whether it's, whether it's having it or not, and it dominates everything in your life. And the Lord says, I want to break that. And this is a principle. I didn't mean to talk about tithing, but again, before the law in Genesis with Jacob, he says, God, if you will be with me, if you will bless the work of my hands, he said, everything I get, I'll give you 10% of it. It's, it's a principle that will bring blessing in God's supernatural hand on things in your life. So if you're not tithing, I recommend you do it because it will. The Bible literally says, if you tithe, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And it's a powerful idea. You think the devourer went away when the Old Testament was done? Or do you think the devourer is still here today? There's some people, and they work and work and work and work, and it's like the harder they work, the less they get. Like, where did it go? God said, I think in Haggai, he said, you work and work, but it's like you have holes in your pockets. See, God wants to break that off people. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children, and we know we are uh, we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly. That's so good. Verse 18. And that's why I don't think that there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good, one, good ones. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all of the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. So sometimes it's really amazing when you're waiting and you're, you're, you know, you're waiting. That, you're getting married. I remember when I got married, you know, you can't see the bride on the wedding day. Why? Because the anticipation grows. Sometimes we live in this instant society, right? We don't have to wait for anything. We push a button and we get it right then. What does that do for us? How does that condition us for kingdom living where God says you will inherit the promise through faith and patience? What happened to layaway? My mom used to do layaway. Like, you don't do a credit card, you do layaway. You, they, they keep it for you, but you come in and pay it, but you don't get it until you pay for it. But we don't want to wait. But God says, man, there's something in the, the spirit of man that if he will learn how to wait, then the payoff will just be beyond expectation. The, the thing that is given is one thing, but just that entire, it's like a nuclear napalm mushroom cloud of, of joy around the, the, the again, when, when I saw my wife, it's amazing what happened emotionally after having waited. It was like I blubbered like a freaking, you know, I didn't look healthy. I was just like, that someone needs to pick him off the floor because I just was like a wet mop. It was just, my emotions were more than my body could handle because I had to wait. All around, this is 22, all around us we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs, but it is not only around us, it is within us. You know, I don't, I don't have an experience with surrogate pregnancy, but I mean, I can just imagine the, the idea of like, I'm sure that there's an app process with that, you know, it's like, click, 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 you know, and then all of a sudden, ding dong, here's your baby. Like, there's something to watching the process that's amazing. And then, of course, you hear the heartbeat for the first time, and then you feel the kick for the first time. And you're like, you're watching it versus you know, yeah, let's have a baby. And again, I'm not, I don't, I'm just, I understand there's probably reasons people would do it, but just the idea that like all of a sudden one day there's the baby, like it just shows up and you didn't, you didn't experience the process. I think God designed it in a way where he's like, I want you guys to watch it grow. I want you guys to wait for that moment. And then I want you to celebrate the moment whenever it happens. And you never forget that day. I'll never forget February 6th. I'll never forget August 13th. These are the days when my children came into the earth and we waited nine months for each one of them. 
Do you know, can you imagine that, that the Lord is contending for your soul and he, he just, He's just waiting for that day when you'll be birthed into the kingdom or our, our brothers and sisters, our family members, like there's that anticipation of the day that they'll that, that the, the spiritual water will break and they'll be birthed into the kingdom of God. Amen? Such an anticipation for that. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. The sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. This is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. It's funny. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. Verse 26. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. So I said this to the men. I said, sometimes all you can do is pray, but sometimes that's all you need to do. Sometimes you can't do anything, you can't say anything, money can't fix it, you can't argue your way out of it. Sometimes all you can do is pray, but sometimes that's all it takes. And sometimes you don't know what to pray, and that's where the Spirit of God will pray through you. Isn't that amazing? He helps you in the moment that you don't know. But, get, you know, three words, I love you, but three words, I don't know. Those three words do a lot for you. I love you does a lot, but also I don't know. God, I don't know. He says to you, it's okay. My spirit will pray this through you. You don't even have to know what to pray for. Let me, let my spirit pray it through you. Will you surrender? Will you let, let your prayer life go and let him birth the perfect prayer through you? Because he will, he will do that if you let him. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. In a staff devotional here months ago, I said, God speaks groan. God speaks groan. He knows what your groan means. So you may not have an eloquent prayer, but you might just have a... Uh, he knows exactly what that means. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is working onto something good. Sorry, this is the last scripture. He knows us far better. This is 28. He knows us far better than we know ourselves knows our pregnant condition and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. So the, the classic scripture is that for those who love God, He works all things together for good. He, he, for those who are called according to His purpose, so when He calls you, and I can assure you that each of you are called of God, He's calling you. If you love Him, which I know you do, because God told me this group has the love of God shed abroad in their heart. So I know the love of God is in your heart. That means every detail in your life is going to be worked out for His good. It's going to be good. Can you guys say that? It's going to be good. Every detail is working together like an, like a, like an ingredient in an amazing recipe. You know, when they do the Passover Seder, they have um, horseradish as part of the ingredient. And it is this bitter, bitter herb. It doesn't taste good, but it's essential for the meal. The bitterness plays a role. It's important. Sometimes we can have bitterness, but again, don't let bitterness have us. We can have a moment of bitterness, but don't let that bitterness take root. It's okay for bitterness to be there, but acknowledge it, but don't let it, as it says, you know, a bird can fly around my head, but it cannot build a nest. The bitterness can come and visit. The anger can come and visit, right? The lust comes and visits, but don't let it take root. When the sin comes, don't let it 
grab a foothold. Don't let it be comfortable. Say, ah, oh, no, you don't belong here. 